Hi, um, this is Tom. I'm David. We are both working on a project called Divas Broker. Um, over the many years, we have always been told Divas is fine. And today I want to tell you, well, Divas is fine. It works. Many of us use it. Many of you probably use it. Uh, we use it at Red Hat for a lot of things. A lot of our software relies on it for many, many years now, for over a decade, we've, we've been using Divas. So why do we keep talking about it? And why do we want to talk to you uh, today about Divas? Um, to explain that, I want to start with a short uh, demo. Um, imagine uh, you used to uh, tool deconf. Deconf is a very simple tool to set and retrieve and query uh, global variables. In this example, we use our terminal to write a value, 2017, into the variable, a variable, um, also some go year. And then we can use uh, deconf to query that as well, and it will return us the value. Now fast forward uh, one year. We, of course, want to update that variable to 2018. But this time, we want to use the underlying bus call. Uh, deconf underneath uses for writes um, um, a bus call to the deconf service. And here we have an example where we use a command line tool to do the same thing. We call a function called change on deconf. Most of the upper part can be ignored. Um, and as you see in the last line, we set the variable ASG year to 2018. And to verify that, we try to read it with the older one. And we notice it wasn't updated. We don't know why. Everything, like if you, if you look into it, everything works. So we just try again. So we do the same command again with a bus CTL call, and we try to read it again. And suddenly, the value appears. So if you try to reproduce it in a command line, it's very easy to reproduce. So what happened here? Like for some reason, the message did not reach the deconf service. Um, this is of course unexpected, and. Of course, this is not what Divas does, like what Divas daemon does all the time. Like, there's some special case why Divas dropped that message. Um, and of course, this is a very crafted example in this case, um, but it's still unexpected. And the keen reader might notice that we have one line that says, expect reply equal false. It's a Divas feature that says, I sent a method call, and I'm not interested in the reply. And usually it's just so the, the other side doesn't have to send a reply and you save um, on a few cycles, and you don't, send, uh, uh, don't have to uh, assemble a reply. Um, but in this method, we, could, we were able to, uh, like to, to craft one situation where, for no particular reason, the Divas team decided to just spuriously drop the message. And this is definitely against intuition, and it makes it like it's an edge case. Um, that is hard uh, to predict and hard to deal with because there's really no real reason to drop this message. Um, and these edge cases exist in Divas Steam for, many, uh, for a long time. And people have, to dealt, uh, have dealt with that in the past. And sure, some of them are edge cases for some people, but for other people, they may end up debugging for two hours some weird situation just because they hit that edge case. Um, right. So and the thing is that this is um, not a problem that is inherent to the Divas specification. This is just uh, some edge case that we found in the Divas, Divas daemon, the reference implementation of it. Uh, and for this reason, and many other reasons like it, we, we decided that to try to investigate if we could write a replacement for the rep reference implementation that doesn't have all of the same problems. So we decided to go from uh, to find what is the right design principle that we could use in order to still implement the same specification, still be a drop-in replacement, but get around some of the, the issues we, we, we discovered here. Uh, thank you. Uh, so firstly, what we want to achieve, uh, one thing we want to achieve is deterministic behavior. So what really is happening here uh, in this example uh, is a race condition. So if you are in a very special situation that you have an uh, activatable service, that is not yet activated, and it is when you, oh, sorry, it is when you send a message to it, and uh, the client that sent the message uh, leaves the uh, disconnects from the daemon before the uh, target service is, has been started. Then that message is dropped. So there's a timing going on there. If you waited a bit longer before the command line tool finished, it would have worked. Um, so this is like a very, I would say. This is not something that is documented in the specification, obviously, uh, and it's something that 
it would take quite a lot of effort to figure out why on earth was this ran message randomly dropped. Uh, so this kind of stuff, obviously, we don't want to do. We don't want that some you, you make an action on the Debus uh, daemon, and then afterwards you do something else unrelated, and it affects the result of what you did. Thank you. Um, moreover, we really don't want to drop messages silently. By that, I mean that if um, one peer sends a message to a different peer, and it doesn't, for whatever reason, go through, then either the target or the destination, sorry, the target, the destination or the sender should be notified about the problem. So I'm not talking about writing some message to a log, but one of the two parties should know that something was dropped. Like, we're not on the network, I mean, we're not sending UDP packets on the network where, where you know that, of course, packets can be dropped. We are on the local machine, there's really no excuse that packets just go missing and nobody's told about it. Um, Moreover, the, what, um, we have limited resources on our machines. So it could, of course, happen that we just don't have the resources to perform some action, like sending a message. Sometimes messages must be dropped. So the, the thing that we want to achieve, as I said earlier, is just not to do it silently. So in that case, you end up you're sending a message, method, say you're doing a method call on somebody, and there is just not enough memory available to do that. Um, you have to figure out what you're going to do. So if you send a met method call, you can re just simply re reply. The daemon can reply to the sender that you're out of memory or you're out of your quota and you can't do it. Straightforward. How about if you send a method, you receive a method call and you want to send a method message, uh, a reply to it. And then you don't have the resources to send the reply. Uh, now you have to figure, well, it's, it's sort of different. It's not, I mean, what happens to the debus daemon is that if you don't have the resources, the daemon tells you that uh, the reply failed to be transmitted. But that's not really what you want, because firstly, nobody is listening, waiting for the daemon to tell them about the replies to replies. Um, and secondly, it wasn't really your fault. Somebody else triggered you to send, uh, to send the reply, and they were not able to receive it. So what we are trying to do, we try to, when there, an action happens on the, on the, on the broker, we are figuring who, which the, which user or which peer is responsible for the action, and we are blaming or accounting on the responsible user, not just the one that made the action. So if a reply is being sent, it's the destination that's responsible. If a method call is being sent, it's the sender that's responsible. Uh, lastly, uh, we want to make sure that so, uh, the Debus daemon or the Debus uh, broker keeps state about all the peers connected to the, to the bus. They can be, um, uh, they can be matches that they've installed because they are interested in broadcasts. Can be outstanding, um, uh, outstanding message replies, and so on and so forth. And what we want to make sure is that if two peers are talking to each other, the state of independent peers that have nothing to do with it should not affect things like the performance, and so on. So let's look at an example. Uh, again, we are now using a civil, civil command line tool to send. Uh, to do a message, uh, to do the method, method call. Uh, we are calling now on systemd the ping method. This is a standard method that most Debus uh, clients uh, implement. And we're just picking systemd here, here at random. It doesn't make a difference which, uh, which daemon we are talking to. Um, and so you can send it, so you send a message call, bus ETL, and it returns, so you send a ping, and you get a pong back, so it replies. It's just a simple echo test. Now. Let's, we made a little uh, client that uh, shows our little problems. So we, we call a mess, um, our own client called noise, and we pass it in a name we want to send noise to, basically. So the point here is that this, is, this could be running as a different uh, user, unprivileged, nothing, to, nothing interesting going on here, really. You just, we are doing some uh, action on the bus targeted at systemd, and now we try again with the same thing. Uh, we try again to call ping, and now it doesn't return. So somehow, this client, which is unprivileged and running as a separate user, so should not be able to, in, to uh, affect uh, the interaction between our user and systemd, is able to stop systemd from replying. So we just have to cancel that. And it's not just this one method call. Actually, with this test uh, client we made there, we are able to basically mute systemd or any, any uh, client on the, on, on the bus. So we are able to stop them from sending any messages at all. So that's bad, right? We shouldn't be able to have an unprivileged client that sends some messages and targets 
some other client and just makes them stop sending anything at all. So what's really just to go back to what's actually ha happening here, that uh, noise is doing the same thing. It's sending ping to systemd, but it's not reading out the replies. So just uh, uh, we send ping to systemd, and systemd answers it, but we are not reading it out. So the buffers inside of the daemon are growing. Um, and because Debus daemon doesn't um, distinguish between method calls and method replies in its accounting, the person that the P that's being uh, blamed for the growing buffer is the wrong one. So it ends up that system D, Debus daemon thinks that systemd is sending too many messages, so they are blocking them from sending any further messages. So in Debus, De Debus broker, we do it the other way around. So we, we track who's responsible, and we will then tell this guy that they're not, no longer allowed to send any messages, uh, but this thing still works just fine. So unrelated peers are not affected. Um, so the Debus broker project is uh, our alternative to the US team, where we try to follow the principles that Tom explained, and some more principles, which we discussed in detail at the, our DevConf talk this year. So if you're interested in why we pick these principles and how we follow them, um, you're more than welcome to look uh, or to ask, uh, talk to us or to uh, look at that talk. Divas Broker today is ready to be used. Um, and there is actually a Fedora change request. And uh, accept that. And uh, Divas Broker will become the default in Fedora uh, F13, um, as it is scheduled right now. Um, and you can already use it um, on the uh, web page we have at the end. Uh, there are instructions on how to use it. It's as simple as installing the package and running one system control enable command line. Um, and it should work as a drop-in replacement for Debus Steam with no uh, observable differences. It should. If there are bugs, or oh, you're always uh, more, more than welcome then report, uh, to report them to us. Um, so as a last part of this talk, uh, we want to describe um, or show some of the benchmarks we did afterwards. So when we did the um, final uh, implementation of Debus Broker. And in this, we have a most basic benchmark we can do. We sent a unicast from a client to a different one and measure how long it takes. And the second one is a pipeline call where we try to send many method calls without waiting for them to be done. And the third one is a round trip where we send a message and wait for the reply. Um, so it's uh, two messages that are sent. And under all benchmarks that we did, we could observe two to three times uh, speed up compared to Debus Demon. Um, and um, other than that, the basic benchmarks uh, don't show any algorithmic uh, behavior, uh, uh, ch um, any algorithmic change in the uh, speed up. So we are observably in all of these three cases just about three times faster as Debus Demon, which surprised us um, and made us uh, a bit happy, I assume. Um, the next, exa uh, next example was just connecting to the system bus. Um, and we have two benchmarks again, where we just connect to Debus Daemon um, or Debus Broker. And uh, the second one is including sending a first message, because a lot of the things people do in Debus is create a, uh, a new command line application or something that just sends one call out or sends a bunch of calls out and then disconnects again. Um, and again, we see a three times speed up compared to Debus Team, uh, which we achieved with Debus Broker. Um, but other than raw performance, what we talked before again is we want to make sure that everything on a bus uh, scales properly so that things that do not affect uh, your operation in a uh, semantic sense also don't do it um, actually when running the command lines, uh, when running the uh, uh, messages. So, two more benchmarks that we have to show is uh, we created a very simple. Uh, a measurement of a single message, but changed um, what kind of background um, messaging or background state the daemon has. So in one example, we took a lot of uh, matches that we install for objects um, on the system bus and incre increased the number of matches, and then looked how long it takes to send a single broadcast that doesn't match either of these matches. And we try to use a common case, so we, we don't try to just uh, um, create a, um, a fake example that wouldn't happen, but instead what we said, um, we imagine the case where many objects exist on the system, and then we say, of course, people match for these objects, um, but there might be an event for only one of these objects firing. And as it turned out, Divas Daemon scales linearly with the number of matches you install on these different ob object paths, even, so, even though when you send one broadcast, it only affects possibly one of these matches. Um, 
And in our case, we made sure Dbus Broker always scales. In this case, it looks constant, but it actually uh, scales logarithmic. Um, so you cannot, um, on the system bus, install matches um, that are unrelated to a specific uh, broadcast, but um, still affect, uh, like, it won't affect the behavior on Dbus Broker, but on Dbus Deem, it might, in quite a lot of cases, except for interfaces, uh, affect the uh, behavior linearly. Another example uh, that we did is instead of installing many batch, uh, matches in, back, in background, we made um, a lot of outstanding method calls. So we said there are many clients running in background which just, just send method calls and wait for the reply. Um, and then we sent a single method call and measure how long that one method call uh, runs. And again, we see a linear behavior of Dbus Daemon uh, uh, yeah, linear behavior and a constant behavior for Dbus Broker. In this case, it is really constant. And it means, regardless of how many other outstanding method calls there are in background, if you send one method call, it will be in constant time on Dbus Broker. Um, with the one exception here, we always assume the CPU time. Um, like, these method calls are not running in parallel, they're just outstanding. So we run them before and then just measure that time used for that one method call. And and yes, and all of these um, um, benchmarks um, show that we try to uh, follow our principles that things run independently of each other, we don't have global state, and we don't drop messages spuriously, and we believe that this is crucial to avoid nasty uh, errors that you have to debug for a long time. Um, and that's uh, why we wrote the Dbus Broker project, and why we believe uh, it's currently ready to, uh, to be used, and it will be used in Fedora, in F 30, and we have already heard uh, from several people who uh, used it in their um, test environments, and we are more than happy to hear about more reports of people deploying it. Sure. Hi. Uh, I just I just wanted to see what it, when you say you rewrote the daemon, does that mean that it's a daemon rewrite using libdbus, or you wrote, rewrote the whole thing? Uh, no, the, there's, I don't think, any shared code between dbus, dbus broker and dbus daemon. Um, libdbus is part of the dbus repository, and it's really, a lot of the details of the daemon implementation are actually also part of the libdbus implementation. So, um, for instance, accounting and so on is all done in libdbus for dbus daemon. Um, so if you want to change that, you actually would have to change uh, libdbus. Furthermore, uh, libdbus and dbus team use a private API, which is not accessible for, accessible for external projects. So, no, there's currently no shared code between the two projects. Um, there's some upstream work in dbus daemon going on for implementing container support, um, which is going to be used for Flatpak portals and any other container use cases. Um, what are your plans for that in Dbus Broker? Um, so our plan is to implement everything that's in the spec, and that's our statement, so we make sure whenever there's something in the spec, we will adhere to it, even if we believe it's uh, in a way that would break our guarantees. And for instance, right now, there are things that the spec allows that would break some of our principles, um, but we follow them, so we say we will still implement them because they're in the spec. Um, we do uh, regularly comment on new, uh, of, uh, on any issues on the bug tracker that we are aware of and try to make sure that our statement, uh, like that the people working on the upstream uh, implementation uh, know what our uh, yeah, comment on that is. Um, for the container one, I think we commented on all of these. Uh, basically fine with the, like, with the idea of the uh, concept of it. There are some details, uh, for instance, Tom commented that it should run as a separate uh, bus name and not on the same bus name. And the other major one was probably about object paths, but um, otherwise we are, yeah, okay with it. And I think it's, uh, I think we stated that all in the public comments. Yeah, I think so. But you haven't started implementing it yet? No, no. I mean, so far, the, the comment from McWitty was that he's still not sure whether this is the final draft, uh, so we did not hurry uh, in implementing it, but we are not opposed to implementing it. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I have a question uh, that in Dbus daemon there is problem with restarting that many clients are not able to survive the disconnection from the daemon. So I wonder if uh, some way of transparent restarts is tackled with Dbus broker. So currently we do not support that. And there's an open issue that was uh, open some time ago in our issue tracker, uh, where somebody explained the, the, the witch for this. And uh, in principle, we think it would be nice to be possible to do that, we'd be able to do that. But at the same time, it would require um, a huge amount of work. Uh, so it's not high on our list of priorities. So we wouldn't be opposed if somebody turned up and you know, made it happen. But at the same time, I don't see it happening uh, anytime soon. Thanks. So there's, there's a weakness in how Dbus handles idle exit of auto starting things. There's like a race condition where you try to idle start, but someone queued you a message and you hadn't got it. Did you ever look at fixing that? Yeah, you mean yeah, exit on idle, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you mean? So? Yeah, idle exit, yeah. yeah, yeah sure. There's actually an, RF, uh, an RFC in the um, uh, Dbus uh, bug tracker where we proposed something called Connect Client and uh, discussed. Uh, the idea is basically to get something similar to socket activation, but for Dbus. So to try to avoid the name activation and instead actually take it just a socket that is pre-connected and has everything already set and do normal socket activation of services. Um, yeah, that would be our preferred proposal. Um, it does change the semantics quite a bit and doesn't make it like trivial for other services uh, to adapt to that. Um, I do remember that we talked about that quite a lot um, during the KDBus days. Uh, I don't exactly remember what our conclusions were. So right now we don't have any differences there to DBus team. So I think that uh, just a conclusion is that uh, as far as we have figured out, there's with the current DBus specification, I don't think it's possible without extending it. So we need to some extension, and we have proposals extension to it, but um, there's nothing that we could just magically fix in our code. Any other questions? Have you thought about taking more of a part in the spec process and maintenance? Say that again? Have you thought about taking, playing more of a part in the specification process and maintenance? Uh, and giving yeah, I mean, rest. we would like to do that. I mean, we have participated a bit, and we would be... Yeah, you definitely participated quite a bit, but, like, <coughs> taking more ownership, maybe. That would be, yeah, absolutely something we're interested in. Oh, I'm interested in, at least. Don't want to, like, put words into your mouth, right there. <laughs> Thanks.